Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Mike, thanks for taking some time to join me on the show again. I really appreciate it. Yeah, good, good to see you, Arne. Um, last uh, discussion, we spoke about how um, the investment process plays out. So what you're looking for from you know, a bottom-up perspective, how it comes together with the ethical investment process, and then position sizing, reasons to sell, et cetera. You brought up some great examples like Cochlear. Um, you also named The Intelligent Investor as one of your, your favorite or most influential books. Um, to, to break the ice with you today, I want to get a, a forecast from you. Um, we know that investors in the big rags, they love to get a forecast about what the market's going to do, um, if this target price is too low, too high. Um, instead of that, what I thought I might do as a, I guess, a Victorian, um, it would be remiss of me not to ask you, um, who is going to win the AFL Grand Final in 2022? Oh, and a, we'll invert that. Who is going to take the wooden spoon? That's a, that's a very unfair question to ask of a Sydney cider. And, and, and so I'm going to give you um, <laughs> a prediction with absolutely no basis. Um, okay. And uh, I mean, I'm in Sydney, right? It's going to be the Swans who are going to win. <laughs> um, and my wife barracks for Hawthorne. She's a former oh, Melbourneian, okay. so uh, yep. I'll give them the wooden spoon. But please don't oh. ask me ask me too much about the players. Okay. Well, I'm a Hawks supporter too, so um, maybe your wife can come down and um, we'll go to the grand finals together. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but mate, that's um, that's interesting. So we'll we'll check back in 12 months and see what's happened. But um, all jokes aside, but today we're talking about um, basically the Australian ethical. Um, your first ETF, uh, been in the managed fund space for a very long time, been in super for quite a long time as well. And now we're, we're seeing you guys branch out into ETFs, exchange traded funds. The fund is listed on the uh, CBOE, AE, AE is the ticket code. I'm hoping you can tell us a bit about it, mate. Uh, the Australian Ethical Australian Shares High Conviction ETF. What's your elevator pitch to investors? If, you, if I can give you, you know, a few minutes, tell us a bit about it. Yeah, look, and and one of the things about us that makes us special um, is that we only do ethical investment, um, and we've been doing it for a long time, um, and we've particularly got a, a long track record in uh, active Australian equities um, management, um, and so I think you know we we sort of see ourselves as experts um, in this sphere of ethical invest, investing, um, and you know we we adopt a true to label approach, so. Um, you know, because we only do one thing, uh, I guess people know, have come to know through time what we stand for. They're not getting greenwash. Um, they they mm. are getting a, a portfolio that aligns uh, with their values. Um, and so the, the step to launch uh, AEAE um, on the exchange is, is an evolution uh, rather than a revolution. Um, so we've already got a superannuation fund. Um, we've already got a, an SMA. We've already got a, a selection of managed uh, unlisted unit trusts. And this is our first um, offering uh, in, in the listed channel. And we think that's a really important channel. Uh, we're certainly seeing wide levels of uptake, uh, you know, expecting wide levels of uptake. And we're seeing good levels of uptake so far um, in that space. And, and one of the words we use is, is sort of democratizing ethical mm. investment because ETFs are, are all about access. Um, sure. And so you can invest in that, you know, with a very small minimum just by calling um, your stockbroker. It's a very transparent um, structure. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a portfolio of, of um, you know, reasonably liquid securities that, that people can um, trade in and out of. And, they can, you know, they can simply see that the price it's trading in real time and make that decision in real time without filling out a whole, whole lot of paperwork. So that's, that's why we're in that space. Um, and we think it, it's going to bring ethical investment um, in an authentic way uh, to, to a much bigger audience. And I think it makes a lot of sense too, because I, I spoke about with, uh, this, this kind of issue with Stuart is that it's very hard to find listed um, vehicles where you can get active ethical exposure plus the you know that track record investing in fact I, I don't think it's you can get it yet um, so this would be the first vehicle this is the first vehicle that you can do that through so um, I think it makes a lot of sense and particularly the 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 demographic that's really a, um, 
I guess, drawn to ethical and sustainable investing is seeking easier ways to get exposure. So I think it makes a lot of sense from a business perspective, if I judge it from the outside as well. Um, as, as I've uh, alluded to with you um, off air, this episode is mostly talking about uh, companies that kind of for one reason or another, I've been in the portfolio, out of the portfolio. I ask you to provide three examples of companies, of Australian companies um, that we can talk through and we can understand the opportunity from a business case. We can understand the history of these businesses and why they came to be in the portfolio, as in why do you see that as an opportunity? Um, and you've brought three companies to the table for us today, which are Helios, Pexa, and Downer. Um, and I'm hoping that you can take these one at a time. Tell us about the company. Tell us, you know, we, we, we spoke in the last episode about business models, why those matter, what's appealing, what's good, what's not. Um, even things like how you and the team went about researching these companies. I always find scuttlebutts really interesting, like how you actually got boots on the ground. So maybe, I, I don't know if you're happy to start with, say, Helios. Um, tell us a little bit about the company. It's had a name change. Uh, I know it's in diagnostic imaging. Um, I'll let you do the rest. Yeah, sure. Like, um, yeah, Helios, it's a company I've covered a long, for a long time. You know, I, I was, before I, I started managing this fund, became head of equities, I, I was the healthcare analyst in the team. Um, but also, um, way back when I was at AMP Capital, I was also uh, a healthcare analyst and spent a lot of time mm, right. um, getting to know um, companies of all shapes and sizes in the, in the healthcare sector. Um, and, and Helios um, used to be called Primary. Uh, healthcare, um, and it was run by a fellow called Ed Bateman and, and various family members. Um, it was, in some ways, it was run a little bit uh, with a kind of private company mentality, um, right. and it, it got a lot of support um, from the share market. And, and in those days, its core business was uh, running medical centres, and, and it was sort of an aggregator and you know, a builder really of, of, of medical centres, which it rolled out. Um, it didn't. It didn't actually really deliver uh, for investors. So. It, it got a lot of support, um, but it turned out that um, like a lot of attempts to kind of roll up um, service oriented businesses and healthcare, uh, it, it doesn't always deliver the economies of scale um, that are expected. And, and also it was, it was quite capital intensive. Um, you know, it had, it had a few other kind of fleas on it. Um, you know, some of the accounting practices um, the way they treated goodwill were, was heavily scrutinized by the market. And I think it really lost, lost the faith of the market, you know, and it, it certainly was criticised for its, its governance um, practices. Um, I mean, we do, you know, we do spend a lot of time looking at the healthcare sector, partly because it's a sector that aligns very well with our um, kind of ethical uh, orientation. And, and we think, mm. I guess another thing is that we think that, you know, that's a sector that it has natural tailwinds through time. I mean, we see um, economy spending, you know, more and more on the healthcare systems through time. And as technology comes, um, new technology comes available, um, you know, there's, there's a natural case to sort of take up that technology. And so the overall spend in health does kind of grow um, beyond, the, beyond the rate of the, of the natural economy. Um, some of the, if I kind of put the ethical hat on for a moment, um, you know, one of the things we're always kind of looking at is the balance of sort of healthcare outcomes between, you know, the patient um, and, and the commercial outcomes in the business. And I think, you know, when you had, you know, that, that, that certainly is something we've got a lot of confidence in now in this company under, under the current um, management team of Malcolm Parmenter. And, you know, there's really, I think, the culture of the company has, has changed a lot, much more towards the sort of model of the Sonic, um, which has really, you know, been at the forefront of kind of clinical, clinical excellence in pathology. So anyway, um, what, what this company sort of done through time is it's actually transitioned from being a, um, you know, a, a primary kind of care medical centre mm. business. It's actually out of medical centres now. Um, and it's mainly a pathology business, an imaging business, day hospital business. Um, and, and, you know, when we kind of became interested in the company, it was when it was going through a, a period of pain a, a few years ago. Its balance sheet, um, you know, was, was stretched. Um, it had some very aggressive targets out in the market around turning around the medical centres, um, which it really sort of had to, had to walk away from. It did a capital raising. Um, and I think a, a, lot, a lot of times what we're looking for in, in situations as a, as a sort of a, an active investor is where we see a, a company with a fundamentally attractive business that's being obscured for some reason. And, you know, so the valuation's not necessarily reflecting that. And it's a great example because we had, a, you know, we've got a really good, 
company Sonic in Australia that you know has, has, has been a, is now a world leader um, in, in pathology and yet we were looking at Helios and we're kind of scratching our head thinking oh this this fabulous domestic um, you know second the second largest pathology player in Australia and uh, the stock's kind of very weak um, you know what would it take really to sort of turn this business around and also turn the perception of, of this business around um, and, and that's how we, we came to, to get involved with it. Um, everything certainly wasn't perfect at, at, at that time, um, but they did put in place a, you know, a different management team. I think the culture of the business has changed and they're doing a lot of things around, around the, the, the operational performance. I mean, some, sometimes in investing you get lucky um, and, I, and, I, and I kind of hate actually to use this example because obviously COVID is there's nothing lucky about COVID. COVID is a, you know, it's a, it's a terrible curse on, on the world. Mm. Um, but in terms of being exposed to a pathology company um, that came to play a huge role in, in, in COVID testing really just cemented their position um, and, and the importance of, of what they do, I think. And so, you know, clearly pathology companies have benefited enormously, both in a profit sense and also um, I think, you know, they, these businesses are businesses that are regulated by government in terms of prices they can charge. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a, a great awareness now of the systemic importance of, of the service they they provide. Um, so there's just, I guess, a few few observations to get us going on mm. how, we, how we came to get involved. I noticed that, um, I noticed that about one in three pathology samples are through uh, Helios. So, and I guess the, as I, I just looked at um, Sonic Healthcare and, and basically the way the company has performed um, alongside uh, Helios both look like they were kind of late 90s IPOs on the ASX, um, at least from the data that I have. And it's kind of been, a, a, in some senses, both have performed well, but it's been a tale of two stories in terms of Sonic seems to just be executing just based on, I'm just basing this purely mm. on the, mm. the share price, which is obviously mm. flawed, but, um, you know, um, you know, multi-bagger like returns there. Um do you see the shift towards, you know, the day surgeries and the pathology and, and radiology as kind of a key catalyst to to improve those economics and be more almost like Sonic in that way? Yeah, look, and, and it, it is, um, it's an interesting comparison. I mean, they certainly have followed very different strategies through time, you know, Helios with that domestic focus um, and, and also with that background, you know, very much in the medical centres, very Sonic, really a global um, specialist in, in, in pathology. Um, I think there's, it's certainly the case that we see pathology as, as the jewel in the, in, in the group. Um, that's what got us attracted to, to Helios. Um, you know, we, we, we didn't actually want them to divest their medical centre business, which they have divested. Hmm. Um, you know, in some ways, um, I would have liked to, to see them turn that business around. I thought there was value um, to be created in, in that business. Um, but, you know, they did get a, an attractive price for it and it, and it, and it also did, um, you know, reset the balance sheet in, in a positive way. And, you know, they have recently bought another pathology business, um, which they think, you know, that it, it is sort of strategically on, on, it's more of a clinical pathology business, which I think is, is, on, is on strategy for them. Um, and then the, the day hospital, the day hospitals have actually probably done a bit better than I that I would have expected. You know, I, I you know, one, the, one of the things that worried me about day hospitals is that just how scalable they really were. Mm. Um, whereas, you know, one thing we know about pathology is, you know, you can you can get a lot of operating leverage, some very high margins, very scalable business, and and Sonic have have um, have shown that. Look, Helios has certainly lagged in terms of the operational performance of its pathology business, and that's. Um, in some senses, that's that's an issue for them, but in another sense, that's the great opportunity. Um, so, you know, if we look at, at pre-COVID, um, Helios was doing about nine percent margins in its pathology business, and um, Sonic was doing about thirteen. And interestingly, the margins in both both companies have been under pressure because you know there's been a huge expansion um, in one of the cost lines around collecting pathology samples, and that 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 part of the value chain had become quite quite competitive and I think there was too much capacity in that space and we've seen some of that wind back. Um, but we were kind of looking at it with the glass half full and sort of saying, well, you know, we know that pathology is, is a fantastic business. It's got great recurring earnings. It sort of grows above average because healthcare sector, you know, grow, grows above average through time. Um, government, yeah, government's a risk because, you know, they, they can sort of reprice, but we're sort of comfortable, you know, with the pricing outlook um, for the business. 
Um, and so we, we're looking at this margin in, in Healy's and really seeing the opportunity rather than the risk of, you know, that kind of 9% margin. And so they've got, in, they, they've got a program in place to increase that by, you know, around 300 basis points um, by 2023. It's a very, look, it's an ambitious target. They're not getting full credit for that in, in the share price. Um, but what we do know is that, you know, any, any kind of incremental margin improvement in this business flows through to the bottom line. Um, mm. So, you know, you can, if you can get a point or two on your margin, you can see a, a dramatic increase in your, in your profitability and, you know, a subsequent fall in your PE. And, and it's not as though the market is giving them a lot for this at the moment. You know, you still look at the PEs of the companies, the respective PEs, and you take out the COVID earnings and, you know, Helios is still on a sub 20, I think it's on a sort of sub 20 PE on a kind of look through basis. And, you know, so it's at a discount to Sonic um, and it's got that kind of operational upside and it's got a strong balance sheet. Um, so they're the sort of things that, that position us that way. I mean, we definitely do look for within, within the sort of some of the growth, more growth sectors that we play in, we, we do sort of um, have a bit of a value hat on. So, you know, healthcare is a big part of our, um, our sector exposure, but when you kind of go through and look at our names, you know, something like a Healy's is really a turnaround name. Mm, it's, not, it it's, is, not, yeah. it's not a name you think of as a, you know, like a high, high PE medical device company. Mm. Yeah, it's a fascinating one. And um, it's one of those, I guess, compounders, right? If, if you've got it in your portfolio, it's the type of business, if it, get, if it can execute, then it's going to compound for many years because you've got that structural tailwind plus the reversal uh, in that performance or that execution. So that's a fascinating one. I'm, I'm actually, the as, as interesting as Helios is, I'm probably most interested in your second company, which you've brought to us today, which is PEXA. Trades on the ASX on the ticket code PXA. It's a recent IPO because it was spun. I guess you could call it an IPO. I don't know if it was officially called an IPO because it's spun out of um, Link, a Link, um, Link Group, which is basically like the share registry kind of financial admin business. PEXA is a really interesting story. I remember when it hit the ASX, there was a big hoo-ha about it because it was a massive, massive listing and it had been called for for a very long time. So maybe... Before we get to the basic IPO, I, I really find it interesting if you could explain it in your own terms, what the business does and kind of the genesis of the business through to now. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, and look, Link is, is, is the major shareholder in the, in the, in the company currently. Um, and so, you know, mm. that, they, that, that continues to be a sort of an important strategic stake that people are, are speculating over what, what might happen to that stake now that Link um, you know, is, is itself, you know, subject of, of corporate interest. But look, PEXA, in simple terms, it stands for Property Exchange Australia. And, you know, the genesis of the business in 2010, COAG sort of formed PEXA to provide national um, e-conveyancing, which is effectively a platform for digital settlement of, of property transactions. Um, and, and so, you know, if you think about the many different parties like conveyances and, and, and lawyers, um, and, all, and all the um, different people that, you know, banks that would have to be typically involved in a property settlement transaction that used to be very paper-based, it was very complex, took a lot of time. Um, mm. There was real opportunity there to kind of, you know, as, as digital technology has progressed to kind of get that all on the one platform and really, you know, there's a huge sort of efficiency dividend to be realised from doing that, but quite, you know, quite a lot of operational complexity um to to achieve that and so you know when you when you kind of think about this business and the 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 model of the business that's always um we've sort of thought about is something like the australian stock exchange um or you know even some of the you know like a real estate.com or a domain group um any of these businesses where you do get these network effects from people, you know, ultimately it makes sense for there to be one or two very dominant platforms that um, provide this huge efficiency dividend and, you know, pay off to those companies that that disrupt those industries or early innovative innovators in those industries. You know, I think of Seek, um, you know, can be enormous through, t through time. And I remember when Seek um, listed and, you know, place I was working at at the time, we sold it way too early <laughs> um, because, you know, they, you know, we just really underestimated the, the ability for that, for that business model to continue to, to, to be able to charge um, a healthy premium for what it does. Um, and even, you know, when we first looked at Link, you know, we've, we followed Link um, for a while, but, you know, we, we first looked at it because Link, I mean, so we first looked at PEXA, we followed it for a while because Link had the stake in it. So we were kind of asking questions about PEXA and then 
they actually tried to um, part part of PEXA became available for sale um, earlier than the IPO, and it, it, the sale fell over. And you know, but we had a look at it at that time, and we were really keen. Right. Um, and it fell over, I think, on on valuation, and you know, they couldn't get enough. Um, people interested. Uh, what, what a different time that was mm. um, to now, you know, with people kind of falling over themselves for these style style of businesses. So it's, it's something that we sort of had an, er, had an early look at. Um, and, you know, I think um, it, uh, or maybe I'll let you ask the next question, but there, you know, there's some sort of introductory comments. Yeah. yeah I'm, mm. I'm in the, the business is in my opinion, almost like a natural monopoly here in Australia, because not all States have mandated um, e-conveyancing if I'm not mistaken and so the, the the states that it does operate in it's basically gobbled up everything because of its unique kind of positioning um, inside of Lincoln with the RBA and settlements with you know the, the various states um, I guess how do you let's let's break it down because they do during the the kind of the separation the spin-off if you like they did talk a lot about the UK opportunity, which I think is a little bit nascent. It's still a little bit early. It's my opinion. Mm. I'd like mm. to rebuff that if you like. But let's start at home. Do you think, like, do, what do you perceive to be the risks here at home for PEXA if there are any? Yeah, sure. Like, And, and you know, you, you raise a very good point. It has had different rates of penetration in different states. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, it's got, it's got a, you know, about an 80% market share mm -hmm. um, in Australia. It's so it's, a, it's an, in an incredibly dominant position. Um, and, you know, some people would argue it's in an unassailable position. Mm -hmm. um, now, I probably wouldn't go that far. You know, it's still it is the ability to, to be regulated. Um, and, you know, there is a, a kind of a, a uh, certainly a, a desire by government to have more than one player in the space and there is more than one player and the desire for from customers to be able to use um, different players um, and that what that's what they call interoperability now there's a whole lot of um, kind of technical work that has to happen to make that um, to make make that possible um, and I think there's different views around the place about how feasible or not feasible some of that some of that kind of technical development is. Um, but what I think what what we would say is that they're just they're starting from an incredibly dominant position. They have a very very attractive value proposition, and there's there's a lot of you know with all these kind of platform businesses, um, you know there's a lot of barriers to entry. So it is it is pretty hard um, for other people. There will be other competitors. Um, you know we don't assume that they get to 100 percent market share. Um, but at the same time, we do assume that they maintain a very high market share in Australia. Um, and, you know, one of the other things is they tend to get around kind of CPI from a, from a pricing um, perspective. So, again, it's, that's, that's a pretty attractive um, kind of combination when, you know, you, I think you, you know, you return, you know, your incremental investment to bring on a new customer is probably not very much typically mm. in, in this style of business. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, there's other things that are going on too that we haven't, um, we haven't placed a lot of value in that, and probably fairly because they, they haven't, they haven't really shown us they could commercialise this. But um, if you think about some of the access to data um, that, that, that um, is, is, is available to them, um, the ability to kind of build product and, and commercialise around that is it's part of their kind of strategic um, journey. And I think they're well placed to do that. I don't know that they've figured out exactly how that's going to work. So, you know, like, and, it, and it's a little bit like, um, like, you know, the UK too, um, you know, the UK, I think they've got 14 FTEs or something. So it is, uh, it is small, um, but, you know, they're talking to all the right people. Certainly as part of our research, you know, we, we talk to um, a lot of the players over there, um, you know, the banks are key gatekeepers over there and try and understand, you know, how, how achievable this is and, you know, regulatory experts and, and so forth. Um, and, and like, you know, we certainly wouldn't we wouldn't say that's a lay down mazare, right? Like, you know, when we when we kind of value the, the opportunity in the UK, I think we we give it a sort of thirty or forty percent chance of, of success. Hmm. Um, but you know, the, the the payoff is huge. You know, the mark is probably twice the size of the opportunity in Australia, and the need is there, um, hmm. right? Because you know, like in all these spaces, we 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 we're finding that you know actually these products they do add real value. These platforms. Um, in, all, in all walks, in a lot of walks of life, 
Um, you know, they, it, it would all much prefer to do it this way than in the old paper-based way and very time-consuming and for sure administration-heavy way. Um, so yeah, there's some of the things that we like, and, and that's kind of how we how we sort of value value it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when um, we did a, we looked at this, um, we realized that there are about 1.5 million um, property like residential property transactions in the UK, um, and there are a few businesses vying for that position like Pixar has here over there. But um, like you said, in terms of the payoff, I think the key is what's the probability that re they re reach some sort of, you know, sustainable business or market share. Over there. I think to hear you say that that's actually really interesting because if they can, you know, if there's a 30% chance or 30% probability that they're, they're going to get that payoff, then you'd expect them to take that every day of the week. So uh, PEX is a really interesting business. I'm sure we'll hear more of that um, over time throughout the Australian ethical publications. But the, uh, the last company is a company that you actually brought up in the previous chat that we had because it was screened out and then it could come into the portfolio, which is Downer. And it trades on the ASX under the ticket code DOW. Um, this is a business that I've when I was studying at Monash University here in Victoria, I saw the downer utes getting around and everyone doing the maintenance and all that type of thing around the place. Um, I'm interested to know, can you, because I don't know a lot about the business, I've got to be honest. Can you tell us a bit about the business, like what it does, and then we can um, bring it up, bring everyone up to scratch, including myself, on how it got into the portfolio? Yeah, sure. So look, it's, it's a contracting company, you know, and, and what that means is that, you know, that contractors effectively, um, typically you think of them as an outsourced service provider. Mm. Um, and, you know, you, they bear a, a portion of the risk of del delivering, let's say, it's the maintenance of a particular building or um, might be a construction project they have to manage or build. Um, and, 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 you know, you pay them an agreed rate for that. And there's different kind of commercial models about how you, how you set that pricing. Um, Down has had a, a bit of an up and down history. Uh, pardon, pardon the pun there. Hmm. Um, and, and look, mainly that's a result of, you know, like a lot of where a lot of companies lose their ways um, when they become very acquisitive. Um, particularly in the contracting space, you know, like it. Um, sometimes you can buy a contract from someone or, or a book of contracts, and you know they can they can be full of all sorts of risks that that aren't necessarily um, sure. identifiable in the in the due diligence process. Um, and really, that's where we're down and struggled historically is has been an ex exposure to to fixed price kind of construction contracts and. Um, you know, interesting, interesting story. Um, I one of my first jobs was as a management consultant on the Evans Deacon uh, train manufacturing site in Maryborough in Queensland, um, and um, you know that that ended up ultimately being owned by Downer. But you know that was my real my first, my introduction to fixed price contracting in the train sector. And hmm. what I learned very quickly was that uh, most most train builds in Australia lose enormous amounts of money. Um, and they're really a loss leader for, you know, hopefully what turns out to be a, you know, a reasonable kind of stream of, of maintenance earnings. Um, and, you know, I can still remember Downer on their Waratah contract, um, you know, going, going back a long time now, but, you know, they had a, they had a huge issue with that contract and they, they lost a lot of money and they were trying to build trains in China and they had a, a lot of problems. Um, I think they were the first Australian train, trains that were trying to be built at, at, out of China. Um, and they, they really, you know, it was, it was, it was almost a company breaking experience for them and, and a full credit to Grant Finn, who's the current CEO of Downer and, and became the CEO, was the CEO at that time and turned that project around and turned the company around really, um, you know, a very, a very technically difficult turnaround situation. Um, and so, yeah, they're a contractor and, and, you know, I mentioned in, in the earlier episode that, you know, it's not, um, you know, they used to have kind of quite a big exposure to the mining sector, and and, and we wouldn't mm. have invested in them um, in, in at our under our charter, our ethical charter. Historically, we don't we don't typically invest in mining companies in in or in many mining companies or mining exposed companies. Um, but um, you know, they've, they've sort of moved out of that business, and and actually, one of the things from a sort of an ESG perspective that's quite interesting is that uh, they've got a very strong franchise in in sort of maintenance of power distribution and, and power networks um, hmm. and this is actually turning into a real opportunity for them because you know as, as we move to a um, you know a less less carbon intensive sort of 
um, and more more renewable generation. There's a lot of money that has to be invested in those, and a lot of upgrades that have to have to occur in those power networks. Um, and so, down are actually you know, talking about this more and more as, a, as an opportunity. And so, you know, I think I think this business, you know, what what I'm interested in this business, why I'm interested in this business is it's one of those business models that's actually changed quite a lot. Um, you know, as they've moved out of mining services, the capital intensity of their business has dropped because if you think about, you know, in that mining 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 contracting business, you've got to own, own and maintain this really expensive fleet. Um, and then you've got to sort of argue like hell with the big mining companies to, to, to get paid and often, mm. often you end up in court. Um, and so they kind of moved out, out, out of that. Um, and they're much more in the kind of government sphere now and the sort of lighter footprint urban services um, you know, managing roads for government, for government managing, as I, as I mentioned, power power distribution, managing um, sort of water um, and facilities management. You know, some of that came out, came out of spotless. Um, and so government, you know, I mean, government's probably 90% or something of their work in hand. So we see that as a very stable revenue stream. Um, and the, really the big change is, is out of fixed price construction contracts. So the construction is not a big part of their business and, and the way, you know, the risk they're taking on on those contracts, I think maybe something like, when I look at the book last, it might have been 1% of their overall, overall book was on what we call a fixed style contract. Um, so, you know, I, I, there, there's some of the things, I guess, that kind of peak, peaked our interest in the company in the sense that it's still trading like a contractor um, from a valuation um, perspective, um, but it's, but it's uh, you know, it's actually changed, it changed its thoughts quite a lot. Hmm. I was going to ask you, and I think you kind of answered it there with the government uh, contracts, which is basically one of the things that you talked about in the previous episode was um, the repeatability in hmm. of earnings in, in businesses. Do you think, because one of the things that if I look at a company like Downer, I'm thinking, um, how do I get, um, I guess, conviction in the forecasts and understanding the business from that perspective in terms of hmm. having um, surety that, you know, the company is still going to be generating X number amount of revenue next year and so on and so forth. Mm. Like how do you get that conviction in the company as well? Yeah. And, you, and you're spot on. Um, and, and a big part of it is that exposure to kind of government work. Um, look, another one is you just get to a size where, um, you know, the ability for one single contract to sort of influence the outcome of the overall company um, is, is, is less, um, it, it, there's less ability for that to happen just because of the scale in the business and the different sorts of activities that you're undertaking. And then I think part of it is also backing management. I mean, you know, I think that after what this company has been through and, and you know, what I remember, what Grant Fenn, Fenn went, went through with the, with the losses that, that occurred on that Waratah contract, you know, they, they learned some very hard lessons. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been a big focus of their journey to, to estimate risk better, and, and, and in that sense, you know, contracting companies are a little bit like insurance companies. You know, if you if you you've got to have a very good understanding of your own cost base, um, and ideally, you know, you're a specialist in certain in certain segments, and that's really why you can add value um, to the person that's outsourcing that that activity to you because you know it better than they do, and you can perform it more efficiently um, than they can. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that's the case in a lot of in a, in a lot of their businesses now, like probably the hardest business is that facilities management business, which is which is still pretty, you know, commoditized. But, you know, they've got some real um, strengths in, in that kind of transport um, area, for example. So, you know, I think I think when I kind of look at the, the overall business and in the power business, you know, I can see this as a company that's got scale. Um, it's, it's got specialist expertise. It's got that recurring earnings. Um, you know, one of the probably the, the weaknesses in, in contracting is, you know, margins. You know, we typically like we, you know, like everyone, we want to find high, higher margin businesses. Um, and you know, that we're talking about a business that's sort of generating around that four percent margin, um, EBITDA margin. You know, it's not, I wouldn't call that a high margin. No. Um, but if when you think about the risk profile of the business, is that has actually changed and. You know, we, we've got a good comparator in Ventia, which just listed recently. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, they're, they're doing a, a margin that, you know, is, is probably suggests that, that Downer can kind of get it up more towards that high fours. Um, and so that, that will that will certainly help them. But the, the other, you know, I guess that the, the, tra the trade-off for having a, a, a not having a high margin um, is that the capital intensity of the business is, is much less than what it was. So, you know, you typically, mining, mining services, for example, or mining contracting where they used to be, you can get a high margin, but you've got to put a lot of capital to work. Uh, we're sort of in a situation now where Downer, they raised capital in, in 2020 
Um, but, you know, subsequent to that, they've sold their um, mining services business, have sold their laundries business. Um, you know, they're very well, they're, they're, they look very good from a balance sheet perspective and they haven't got to look, put a lot of capital back into the business. Um, but the valuation hasn't really moved, you know, so you're always trading off these um, these different variables, you know, in, in funds management, sort of saying, well, what, what you know, what am I, what am I getting or not getting? Okay, so this ticks say three of three of the four boxes, but I'm buying it on a PE of fourteen times, and mm. um, I've got the ability to sort of generate really strong cash flow and cash flow that I think is sort of backed by government to some extent. Um, you know, that that feels like a good equation to me. Hmm. Yeah, it's a really interesting business because um, it's it, admittedly it's not one that I follow closely. I remember quite a few years ago, um, the, the the kind of this the the route in mining services when commodity prices um, tanked and there was a you know a bit of a washout in some of the companies and and some of the companies looked dirt cheap. And um, it's interesting because down as history goes back to the 1930s. And like you said, management have been in place since 2012. So, I mean, there's a bit of staying power in this business. So just kind of that resilience, I guess, is something that shouldn't be overlooked as well. Yeah, and you, and you definitely do get, you know, in, in the classic kind of commoditized parts of contracting, you do get periods of time where there's, a, there's, there's you know, there's, there's just too much supply of contracting services. And what, and what typically happens then is contractors take on too much risk, like an insurance company. Um, and you know it's it's difficult because it's contracts are by nature fairly opaque, and you often don't find out uh, until many years later when it's in court and you're getting hit with huge litigation and or you know huge cost overrun. So that's why it kind of you know it does depend a little bit on you know like for example you know we're going to an environment where inflation hasn't been a problem for a long time. Um, you know starting to see inflation uh, come back onto the scene. You know, one of the questions, you know, I guess when we went through our due diligence was down, it was how do you, how does that affect your business? You've got this huge labor force. Um, and, you know, we had to get comfortable that they had the ability, you know, to pass some of that, that cost base on in, in their contract structures. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you've entered into a big, you know, if, you've got a, if you're running a different sort of business, which has a big uh, fixed price construction component, and then you sort of cost base um, goes up um, dramatically, you know, it can be a company ending situation. Mm. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, contractors have, have, have tended to trade at discounts to the overall overall market through time. Mm. It's fascinating because um, obviously you're placing a lot of stock there in, in the management team, but they've, I guess they've got the nows for it and they've done it um, well so far. So um, that's a fascinating business, Mike. You've got Downer there. So just to recap on those three, we've got Helios, formerly known as Primary Healthcare, uh, PEXA, PXA on the ASX, um, spun out a link group, which still has a pretty substantial holding in the business and downer which trades in the sx under the dow ticker code um three really interesting companies i know that in the high conviction fund um an australian ethical there are about 25 to 30 positions so um people can can go online and learn more about australian ethical i'll have a link in the show notes if you're interested um in hearing more from mike and the team um there is a link there uh, you can subscribe to updates and you can learn more about the etf which trades on the cboe uh, under the ticket code AEAE. -E. Mate, I've got one final question for you, which is just um, the one that I like to ask everyone, which is uh, if you could go back in time and tell a younger you something about money finance or investing, what would it be? Oh, look, I, I just think patience um, is, is important. Um, I think, you know, that the, probably the thing I'd say is do as much work as you can up front because things will inevitably not go according to plan in most of your investments. Um, but if you sort of know why you're going into something um, and you're patient, uh, very, very often, you know, it makes sense to, to stick, to stick with, with it if you've done the work. Mm. Um, so it's no, it's no good sort of um, just sort of copying someone else's kind of idea or, you know, you've got to kind of believe in it yourself mm. because it, it'll, it'll be put to the test. Um, and uh, and you you got to be able to kind of step up when it when it counts. Mm, I like that. It's like mm. do the work, do the honest work, uh, do it up front, and then you can let patience um, kick in. And and that's you know where the kind of the tipping machine of investing um, in the stock market comes comes through with the goods. So, Mike, I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining me on the show. Thank you so much. Really good to talk to you, Owen. <laughs>